This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we're joined by Pablo Salon. He's Bolivia's ambassador to the United Nations, just back from climate talk negotiations in Bonn. Stay with us. Music of Bolivia here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Even as the world faces a series of extreme weather events that scientists warn uh, is related to global warming, international climate negotiations are moving at a glacial pace. The latest round of climate talks in Bonn, Germany, ended last week, and diplomats have just one more short meeting in China in the coming months to hash out their differences before the critical high-level climate conference in Cancun, Mexico, at the end of the year. At the meetings in Bonn, the negotiating text got a lot bigger, and a number of proposals from developing countries were added into the controversial agreement that came out of the divisive Copenhagen summit last year. Some fear the new text could slow down talks in Cancun, but other Others say the concerns of the majority of the world's countries are finally represented in the text. For more on what this means for a binding global agreement on climate change, I am joined here in New York by Ambassador Pablo Salon, Bolivia's permanent representative to the United Nations. Uh, he was just in Bonn last week. Welcome to Democracy Now! Hello. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. And it's good to have you with us. As you listen to the litany of extreme weather all over the world, your thoughts as you return from Bonn? Well, um, I would say that what you have shown is a reality that uh, is not changing as, as fast as we would want the, the process of negotiation. I have heard speeches in Bonn relating the, the situation in Pakistan. But the concrete pledges to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are the same that one year ago. And with the current pledges of emission reductions from developed countries, we are going to be in something like 3 to 4 degrees Celsius, an increase in 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. Now, what we are seeing, what you have shown, is related to an increase of 0.2. Uh, less than one degree Celsius. So, can you imagine a situation where this triples or, or multiplies by four? It's, it's unbelievable. And still, developed countries have put on the table targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that will increase the temperature dram dramatically during the, the, the coming years and during this century. So, that is something that until now, it hasn't changed. I go negotiation to all the negotiations during this year. We have all the put all the evidence, and still the pledges of developed countries remain the same, very very low. Almost do business as usual. What about the United States in particular? Where are we on this? The United States has made a very, very small pledge. It is something that means to reduce 3 percent from the levels of 1990. To compare it, other countries, like the European Union, have said that 20 percent to 30 percent. The United States, 3 percent, so almost nothing at all. Why? That is the question. 
because corporate uh, interests, economy, profits, have more weight in the negotiation than I would say to preserve life and, and, and biodiversity and, and Mother Earth in, in, in climate talks. So that is the problem that we are facing. Uh, in Cancun, the, the greatest challenge is, are we going to have a deal where developed countries are going to reduce in the next uh, seven years at least the half of their emissions? Yes or no? We say it very clearly. If this doesn't happen, what we are seeing now is just the first episode of a, of a tragedy. So uh, we need to put a lot of pressure around the whole world if we want really to have a greenhouse gas emission reduction that saves life. Just remind people, how would you summarize what happened in Copenhagen, just to get a sense of where we are now? Well, what happened in Copenhagen was that the process of negotiation was kidnapped by a group of countries. Usually we negotiate 192 countries. And suddenly in Copenhagen, a group of countries said, now, this is the Copenhagen Accord. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. You have one hour to sign it. And of course we said, no, not at all. We want to discuss it. Why? Because in that Copenhagen Accord said that the target was to limit the temperature to 2 degrees Celsius. So that is almost three times what we are seeing now. And there are a lot of countries that are saying we should limit the temperature to, to 1.5 or to 1 degree Celsius. That is the proposal of Bolivia. Why? Because some states are going to disappear. There is a state called Tuvalu. It is, its wide is 607 meters. Its highest hill is 4 meters. If the temperature keeps raising, it will be under the water. So now we have, after the climate talk in Bonn, a new text. It's bigger, as you have said. But it has the proposals of developing countries <coughs> to limit the increase of the temperature, to develop a climate court of justice, because somebody has to be responsible for this, to not only commodify to, to not uh, make profit through a new market, carbon market mechanism, but also to recognize the rights of Mother Earth in the process of negotiation. So now we have a text that reflects, from our point of view, the proposals that were made in Cochabamba, in the People's World Conference on Climate Change and Mother Earth rights. So now the, the key thing is, from here until Cancun, what is going to prevail? It's going to prevail the people's voice, Mother Earth's voice, or it's going to prevail corporate's voice. I'm looking at a piece by John Vidal in The Guardian. A new research reveals carbon emissions from rich nations could actually rise under loopholes in the proposed U.N. climate deal. Um, what are these gaping loopholes uh, in the climate change treaty put forward in Copenhagen? Well. It's, for example, a country says, I'm going to reduce 20 percent. So you say, oh, that's fantastic. But in reality, there is some tricky parts in the, in the, in the different treaties that allow him, for example, to buy uh, certificates of emission reduction in another developing country. So he, in reality, is not going to reduce. He's just going to pay somebody else that is going to do his job, but there won't be a real emission reduction. Second, there is an, a, a way of accounting. So I say, I'm reducing because now I have planted some more trees here, and I account them in this way. So there are too many things in the negotiation that really make th things even worse. So today in Bonn, or last week in Bonn, it was very clear that they say the average is going to be a reduction in the best scenario of 18 percent, taking into account the levels of 1990. But because of these loopholes, in reality, there could be an increase to 4 to 7 of, or 7 percent of the emissions of 1990. So what we are asking for is that when a country says, I'm going to reduce, say it very clearly, how much are you going to reduce domestically? 
without any kind of loopholes, without any kind of common market, without any kind of offsets. That is the only way to have a clear negotiation that is transparent for people. Has the U.S. attitude changed at all? I mean, after Copenhagen, you spoke out fiercely against it. President Morales did as well. The United States penalized you by millions of dollars, saying if you wouldn't sign on to the Copenhagen Accord. Is that right? Yeah. They... Did you sign on? No, of course not. I mean, for—, for... They, 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 they penalized us with an aid of $3 million, because they said we didn't support the Copenhagen Accord, and we said, you can keep your money. But uh, we, we are not fighting for, for a couple of, of, of coins. We are, we are fighting for life. Why? How does this affect Bolivia? Well, we have glaciers, for example, in Bolivia. Until now, we have lost one-third of our glaciers. If this situation continues in Bolivia, we're going to lose the vast majority of our glaciers, all our mountains will be naked. And you know the consequences that, uh, for that in relation to water, for agriculture, for, for, for drinking water for the populations there. And uh, this is a situation where we cannot uh, hide uh, ourselves. Uh, we think that there has to be a very responsible action. And coming to the first part of your que question, I would say that the situation in the United States has begun to move backwards. What I feel is that when this uh, proposal of, of law was withdrawn from the Senate, then everybody began to say, oh— When the energy bill. Yeah. Then mm, the United States mm -hmm. is, is not even going to go, go move forward, move beyond what they have already said they were going to do, but instead they can move backwards. That is the perception that I feel in, 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 from other developed countries. So if the United States is not going to do too much, then the others say, why should I do it? And, and then comes a discussion of, well, if I do more and the United States does so less, then I will be in a difficult situation to compete with the products of the United States, because I will have to invest more in, in clean energy. And so. At the end, what happens is we're in a very difficult situation. It's interesting. I remember when uh, Bolivia held the uh, climate change conference, um, the foreign minister of Ecuador said, in response to Ecuador also being penalized millions for not signing on to the Copenhagen Accord, the U.S. cutting off money to uh, Ecuador, they said they would give that money to the United States, an equivalent amount of money, I think it was like $2 million, if the U.S. would sign on to the Kyoto Treaty. Um, but I wanted to go back to a few weeks ago, we had Maude Barlow on, the former uh, water representative at the United Nations. Um, the day that the resolution was passed that you, Ambassador Pablo Salon of Bolivia, had put forward around the issue of water and sanitation, this is an excerpt of what you had to say at the U.N. At the global level, approximately one out of every eight people do not have drinking water. In just one day, more than 200 million hours of the time used by women is spent collecting and transporting water for their homes. The lack of sanitation is even worse because it affects 2.6 billion people, which represents 40 percent of the global population. According to the report of the World Health Organization and of UNICEF of 2009, which is titled Diarrhea, Why Children Are Dying and What We Can Do, Every day, 24,000 children die in developing countries due to causes that can be prevented, such as diarrhea, which is caused by contaminated water. This means that a child dies every three and a half seconds. One, two, three. As they say in my village, the time is now. Bolivia's ambassador to the United Nations, Pablo Salon, he's our guest today in studio. The first resolution on this issue, explain. Well, in the UN, we 